Hi, everyone. This is Leslie Law, the creator and MC of Sandbox Radio. Thanks for listening to the podcast. This episode, Howl, was recorded in front of a live audience on October 21st, 2013, at West of Lenin in Seattle, Washington. Join us for our next show, The Food of Love, on January 13th, 2014. We'll be recording live at ACT Theatre in the heart of downtown Seattle. Tickets available now for all our shows coming up at ACT in 2014 online at acttheater.org. And now, Howl, featuring special guest poet Karen Finneyfrock and H.P. Lovecraft's classic story, Herbert West, Reanimator. Sandbox Radio, we'll stay all day. In the backyard, we'll play. Jump into our sandbox. We build castles and things worth become things. Sandbox Radio. Sandbox Radio. the center of the universe. In tonight's episode, new radio plays from Elizabeth Heffron and Wayne Raleigh, a fresh new episode of Markheim by Paul Mullen, a very special spooky episode of Cousin Katie by Scott Augustson, special guest poet Karen Finneyfrock, with the Sandbox Radio players and music from the Sandbox Radio Orchestra, led by Jose Juicy Gonzalez. So, sit back and relax as we take you into the world of Sandbox Radio Live. Sandbox Radio coming to this year's annual StopWasteSeattle.org Halloween Monster Mash Bash! <laughs> Holy smokes! Look at all the great costumes! Okay, just a reminder everyone, everyone please listen. All the plates, forks, spoons, and knives are compostable. And big news, so are the cups this year. Oh, oh, please, but don't put anything hot or alcoholic in them or they will disintegrate. But please put all silverware plates and cups in the compost and help this year's Monster Mash Bash be another zero waste function. You rock, Just calm down, you. Yeah. Don't forget to sign up for the Scariest Monster Costume Contest and have fun, everyone. <laughs> Just, okay, cups in the compost and have fun. <laughs> oh, Becky, you made it. I'm so glad. Oh, hi, Marjorie. Uh, yep, I made it. Uh, are you meeting people? Yeah, a few. I'm still getting settled, but I didn't want to miss the party. Well, I think it is so good you came. Our zero waste functions are the best way to meet the office. Everyone's so nice and fun. I can tell. Everyone seems so great so far. And you dressed up. I love it. I love the broom. Uh, let me guess. What are you supposed to be? Uh, uh, a janitor? What? A, a green janitor? No, I, I'm a witch. Oh. My skin is green because I'm a witch? Oh. 
I see it now. I, I thought the broom was janitor. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. Well, we were supposed to come as our favorite monsters, right? That, that's right, yes. Well, I see it now. You've got a bigger nose than usual. Yeah, that's right, it's, it's putty. It's um, quite a bit bigger than my real nose. Uh, so, what are you supposed to be? I am a modern American landfill. Oh, I see. The real monster, Becky, the real monster is rampant consumer waste. That's very clever, Marjorie. It covers our bodies as it covers the planet. That is the statement I make tonight. Uh, excuse me. Rick, uh, cups in the compost, please. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> excuse me, Becky. Rick! Is that the right one? No, no, the other bit! Please use the guy! Marjorie always comes as a modern American landfill. She never wins scariest monster, poor thing. <laughs> She's very dedicated. I'm Jeff. Becky, hi. Wow, that is some costume. Well, what do you think? Scariest for sure, right? Did you make this? Oh, yes. <sighs> what are you supposed to be? I'm a witch. A witch? Yes, a witch. What are you? I'm Syria. Oh. <laughs> what? I'm the current situation in Syria. I see. You see it? Well, I... I made this I... part out of an old milk crate with a piece of tube I found, and these are soccer cleats I tore the bottoms off of, and this is some hair I got from a guy, and then I painted this part yellow, and these are plastic film canisters. Oh, is that an actual bear trap? Yep. Oh, does it hurt? Yep. Wow. That's fake blood. Wow. That's real blood. Oh, I, I don't get that on you. Okay. See it now? I, I, I'm sorry. I guess I don't really understand. I know. I, exactly the particulars of what is going on in Syria. I know, but it's hella effed up, right? I mean, seriously effed up. Yes. Yes. It is. Thanks. So, did you make that witch hat out of black construction paper? Yes. Oh, cool. It's, it's scary. Thanks. <laughs> well, uh, I gotta... Sure. My friends are over there. Yeah, bye. You see ya. Hey, Becky. Is Jeff being Jeff again? Oh, hi, Grace. I think maybe I didn't understand the party. Oh, please. He thinks he's so cool. I liked his costume better the first time he wore it. When it was called Libya... <laughs> He's just painted it yellow. Oh my God, you look so cute. Thanks. You look, oh my God, you, you look great. I love this. Thanks, I was up all night. I always wait till the last minute. Ew, how did you make the intestines? Stuff pantyhose with bubble wrap and don't say anything. Lard. Oh, gross. It looks <laughs> like your midsection has actually been slashed wide open. Thanks, I should have used more blood. Plus, I keep tripping over this one. So, what are you? I'll give you a hint. I've been violently gutted, disemboweled, skinned, alive. Texas Chainsaw Massacre! No, I'm U.S. democracy as we know it. <laughs> oh. Oh. You, you can't tell? No, I see it, I see it. I knew it, I should have used more blood. Hola! What is up, you bitch? Fizz bump! No way. You are the bitch, bitch. I should have known you were going to steal my costume. You totally stole my costume. Yeah, except you look awesome and I am fat. Shut up. You are so beautiful, even with your intestines hanging out of your belly. You are, like, so gorgeous. How did you even make your viscera? Cut up sponges dipped in red temper paint and then wrapped in Ziploc. So when you squeeze them, they go like this and shit. You are so smart. I hate you because of how smart you are. Did you guys plan this? No, that is what's so crazy. You both came as U.S. democracy as we know it? Nah, I'm just saying gun control legislation. <laughs> oh 
Oh my god, uh, yes! I'm any chance this country has at a meaningful solution to the unending gun violence that has since 1968 killed more Americans than every single war in our nation's history, including global terrorism and 9-11, bitches! <laughs> Plus, your hair is, like, perfect. That's a clever idea, you guys. Hey, Trish! Wait up! Oh, Jinkies, I gotta go. It's Bob from IT. We kind of did it once. Come on, I need your help with my entrails. Bax, run interference. Was that Trish? Hi, Bob. I'm Becky. I had a question about my new workstation. Have you tried rebooting? Try rebooting. That was Trish, wasn't it? Finally, Bob. A monster I recognize. The creature from the Black Lagoon, right? I'm the Fukushima nuclear disaster, actually. <laughs> oh. Right now, as I'm saying this, hundreds of thousands of gallons of radioactive waste is pouring into the Pacific Ocean like Niagara Falls on acid. Right. I'm Philip. Sorry if you were trying to ignore me like I don't exist. Oh, sorry. Philip, hi. Who are you supposed to be? Peak oil. Oh, of course. I get it. You're all covered in oil. Actually, this is human fecal matter. Which is what we're all going to be covered with when the oil runs out. Did she say anything about me? It's kind of conceptual. I, I see. Um, no, I don't think so, Bob. But when a gallon of gas costs $35 at the pump and the toilet stop flushing, it won't be conceptual. I can guarantee you that. Uh, Trish and Grace went over there, Bob. You know, you, you can't ignore me forever. Ooh. I, I don't, I'm not. Phil, chill out. We've got at least another hundred years in the ground, plus fracking. Try ten years, fish man, and hydraulic fracturing is going to poison our water long before Fukushima and will probably rupture a major fault line and send the entire west coast into the Pacific Ocean long before it even makes a dent in our consumption. Plus, Trish doesn't even like you, man. You don't even understand our relationship, okay? <laughs> Hello, everyone! Oh, no. Who is that? Accounting. Phil, get to the food, quick! I'm on it! The whole department? Who are they? The population explosion. Who? The population explosion! <laughs> Ten billion people on the planet! By the dawn of the 22nd century! All competing for... Finite resources! Phil! <gasps> they ate all the food! Uh. And all the drinks! Uh. Yep. Every year. Nothing left. Any shrimp puffs? Nothing! I said nothing! We'll be in the bathroom! For about an hour! The bathroom! Get to the bathroom! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ow! 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 Are you the do girl? Ah! Oh, God. Um, hi. Oh, God. Are you all right? I'm Brede from Legal. I'd shake your hand, but I've got this thing. Oh, you're sick? Oh, you know, always kinda. But it helps with my costume, I guess. Are you the bird flu or something? Well, this year I wanted to do something more realistic, so I came as global antibiotic resistance. <laughs> it's a real problem. They are so overprescribed that all we need is one superbug that is airborne and resistant to current drugs and <laughs> that's it for the human race. <laughs> oh, how, Excuse me. How, how did you make that boil on your neck? Oh, this is a real boil. <laughs> now my doctor doesn't know what it is. He was gonna lance it, but I thought I'd keep it for the party. <laughs> Would you like one of my blue cheese and bacon wrapped melon balls? No, no, thanks. I feel bad because I took two and now they're all gone. You sure? Yeah, um, actually, I think, I think I'm not feeling well either. I think I just need to go home and... Hi, Renee, how are you feeling? I just can't kick this thing, but okay, how are you? Oh, I'm just hungry for brains. Arg! Becky, this is Daniel. Arg! I'm the zombie apocalypse! Didn't want to come as just one zombie? I thought of that. But then I thought, what's scarier than America's obsession with an undead pandemic? It's like we all want the world to end so bad it's become our weekend entertainment. I think for most people, anything, even the risk of having your flesh torn from your bones by swarming cannibals, is better than having to get up and face another crushing day, sitting in traffic to get to a job you hate, so that you can buy things you don't need from a system that just wants to profit from your labor 
until you collapse exhausted and die. And you're a witch, right? Actually, I, uh, I, I was just on my way out. I'm not feeling... I, I'm, I'm having a bit of an anxiety attack, actually, I think. Wow, this is the scariest Halloween party I have ever been to, actually. Oh, okay, I'll walk you out. Um... Marjorie's announcing scariest costume, you guys, don't leave. <laughs> Uh, the winner of this year's scariest monster costume is... Yay! Becky! Our latest addition! She is a witch! <laughs> that is scary! <laughs> Oh, now, Becky, c come on up and get your prize. Starbucks gift card. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for this. Uh, actually, I'm not a witch. Actually, I'm catastrophic climate change, and my green skin represents the rapidly melting permafrost layer, and my pointy hat, that represents the tip of the iceberg, which is basically all there is that is left of them. <laughs> and unless we do something to stop it, the oceans will rise, the seas will boil, the magnetic poles of the earth will flip, killing the bees and disrupting the food chain so severely that all life on the planet earth will starve and the plants will choke and the earth will burn and we will die. Every last thinking one of us will die. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Karen Finney Frog. This poem begins with an epigraph by Hans Christian Andersen. But the mermaid has no tears, and therefore she suffers so much more. The last spell of the sea witch. I only need to stand near a bowl of water, or by a half full shaker of salt, to offer you the north wind in a rope knotted, or a ship with a pregnant sail. Given a conch shell full of driftwood, or enough seaweed to strangle a mare. I could load your deck with gasping tuna, shoo barnacles from the hull like I'm sweeping the floor, but I'll need a shipwreck to offer you true love, or legs, or whatever the girls beg me for this time. Give us perfect breasts, they tell me, and eyes the color of snake oil. Give us hips that fit into vinyl dresses. Give us claws to keep the men we beckon. Does anyone ask for heaven anymore? Once girls wanted eternity, a soul to barter with, and a kingdom above the spray. Now they ask for flawless photographs, armies demanding their signature, songs written in the key of them. I am a dying sea witch, scaly with kelp and pruned. I won't leave you moaning. Girls should be different. Girls will live in the world as they make it. But think of me as you stand by the boat's rail and the wind pulls pins from your hair. Old women were girls once, testing their voices on the men who sailed past them Sometimes the prince doesn't love you. Don't pin all your hope on legs. <laughs> the Street After Dark. 
We left our cobwebbed kitchens to float the lantern sidewalks, cursed goblin children hexed into witches and quarterbacks. Past the questionable safety of our porches, we swam to the buoy of the lamplight. The street's face was painted. Trees pretended they weren't following us. Full moon squeezed into the open mouths of pumpkins. Some houses had doorbells and some had knockers and fathers grinning vampire teeth. One mother offered a bowl full of apples. From the bottom of her dress hung a tail. Toilet paper dripped from hedges like white weeping willows. Styrofoam tombstones grew weedy in the lawns. The night stepped closer when we weren't looking. We heard it breathing before we knew it was there. The street tilted and turned into rubber, and even the cowboys ran home. We brushed our blacked out teeth white again, while mothers searched our buckets for traps taking ripped plastic wrappers and caramel apples, holding sugar tubes up to the light. They were looking for things we didn't know names for, waiting in the bottom of the candy bag, disguised to our eyes as sweet. I turned 40 recently, and um, my last poem is a persona poem. It is in the voice of death. <laughs> and it's called, At 40, Death Pays a Visit. <laughs> that ache in your knees means something. Who is it you remind me of? Your grandmother. 17 years ago, you're starting to look like her. Here, I'll light it for you. Take the box, I'm sponsored. <laughs> Do I need to remind you, most of your ancestors didn't get this long. Your sister, only 36, so I'm not interested in your weeping or pleading. I haven't come to play escort yet, just to say, think of me. <laughs> I can't offer any clues on when I'll be back, not a nod or a wink, but try to enjoy those breaths you take and the sound of all that rain you can't stand. People don't always pay their taxes, you know. There really isn't anything else like me. <laughs> Entropy Chaos Oblivion as we all vainly struggle in the death grip of these rapacious gods, we feebly forge frail outposts along our Plutonian shores. We create tiny islands of coherence in the vast ocean of the cosmos. They comfort us, provide us safe havens from the inevitable storm, lend us purpose and understanding, provide a box in which to place our identities, creating fragile boundaries that define us. The forces that truly shape our destiny watch with indifference as we blunder about within these self-imposed asylums. They are observing us from that unknowable, unfathomable region. From that place far outside the parameter of our senses. Look! Up ahead! Just over there! Is that a signpost? What is that? Seriously, what the hell is that? Can anybody else see that? Oh, I thought I saw something. <laughs> uh, I just totally forgot what I was talking about. God, I fuck, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> it must not have been terribly important. It was the darkness at the center of the universe. And the chaos the center. Oh, yes, I remember! From that place where no living soul returns unchanged from beyond the box, 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 box. Beyond the box, the new serial from Sandbox Radio. Hear the first episode live coming January 13th to the Falls Theater at Act 
Gott. started using a French press. Hey, Lena. Hey, Marco. Have a cup of coffee. I made it with my new French press. Speaking of French press, hey, what's missing? Where's your cousin Katie? Well, that's funny. I haven't seen her. Is that your laundry over there on the couch? <gasps> no, it's Katie's. Something is wrong. She's usually tidy. She's a tidy girl, all right. Oh, this isn't like her. Oh, are those clothes moving? I thought it was just me seeing things. Oh, God, don't be a rat. A rat or worse. No. Ah! Ah! Katie. Katie. Gotcha. My cousin Katie from Catch a Can. Oh, Katie. I just love Halloween, don't you? Well, sometimes it feels like a chore. What's your costume? Oh, probably just dig a wig and heels out from under the bed. Oh, Marco. Drag is the lazy man's Halloween costume. Not if you're gay. Well, it can be done with some finesse. Back in Ketchikan, when Rufus Alphonse went as Madeline Murray O'Hare and his twin brother went as Simone de Beauvoir, they didn't just throw on a granny dress and a share wig. Regardless of what Mr. Mackerel Lemour says, a thrift store is no place to... Oh, Listen to me. I get all worked up about Halloween. What are you going to be? Oh, well, I want to represent Alaska, so I'll either be a big hungry grizzly bear or the frozen corpse of a Klondike gold rush prospector caught in a nasty avalanche. If you want to be something scary from Alaska, why don't you go with Sarah? No, Marco. <laughs> Don't say her name. That was a very dark time in Alaska's history. <laughs> well, have fun. I think I'm going to skip it this year. Just stay home and watch something scary on the Netflix or the Hulu. Oh, Lena, that just ain't going to happen. No one should be alone on Halloween. It's both sad and dangerous. <laughs> Why are we in Pioneer Square? Well, first thing on the agenda is a zombie flash mob. Ooh, flash mob. I was suspicious of the whole flash mob thing until I realized it was just the same thing we did in high school in Mr. Browdick's, the civics teacher. If you all take out your copies of the Articles of Confederation... Every day for a week at exactly 2.10, we'd stand up and... Then comrades, comrades, at the last fight, let us face. Sometimes it was. Then. Sounds fun. Well, what happened to Mr. Browdix? Well, he got kind of jumpy and went to live with his daughter in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The point is, we didn't know we were on the vanguard of the flash mob movement. Then, of course, we grew up and took on adult responsibilities, put such foolishness away, which doesn't seem to have happened in Seattle. Ergo, flash mobs with grown men and women. They aren't all grown ups. <laughs> Look, there's some kids. Oh, perfect. Halloween is all about children. Kids, come here. Hey, Katie. My cousin Katie from Catch a Cat. I'm Toby. Maud. Ruth. We're, We're triplets. Would you like to hear a spooky story from Catch a Cat? Yeah. Okay. One day, old man Sweeney 
was standing on his back porch when he heard something in the bushes. All right, come out of there. I got my rifle loaded for bear. If it's you pesky kids. But it wasn't the pesky kids. It was the were moose. <gasps> A moose in all its five-ton glory with crazy eyes and 20 feet tall because this moose was standing on his hind legs <laughs> like a man. Oh. Yummy. He was frozen in fear. You can't be real. You hoo devil. <laughs> and the were moose bit old Sweeney on the hand. And he ate three of his fingers. Oh, ah, oh. And then he ate his toes. Yay! True story. Katie. It is. The hind leg walking, the eating people? Oh, yeah. Well, what happened was when they arrested Seanette for running the you-know-what lab in her grandma's trailer when her grandma had the broken hip, they took Seanette but left the... The ethme? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the moose tried it, and, well, I don't have to tell you about moose not having much self-control. Biting people is just the beginning. Where the high school kids park over by the reservoir, there was a... I'm Mandy. I'm in charge of the flash mob tonight. Katie, right? That's me. A uh, victim or zombie? Well, I think I'd like to start living and then get infected and go all brave. Oh, uh, I'm going to stop you right there. See, a zombie rots a little. Usually the soft palate goes pretty quick, as well as the nasal cavity. So it isn't brains. It's more brag. Everybody try it. Brag. Good. You're Katie, right? I read about you in the slog. What's up? It's my fiance, Robin. She was acting strangely, and now she's missing. Okie dokie. Katie, what will you do? I have master Alaskan tracking skills. I'll find her. Come on. She wears Shalimar, right? Yes. <laughs> Everyone, this way. Oh, my God. Okay, right here. Oh, Katie, the waterfront has rats. Oh, Lena, everywhere has rats. Oh. Hey, guys, come on. Tonight sucks. It isn't that bad. You've made me hate Halloween. Hi, guys. Oh, aren't you Katie from Ketchikan? Yeah. My cousin Katie from Ketchikan. And you're Karen Finneyfrock, poetess. Poet, actually. <laughs> what are you doing out on a night like this with three teens in tow? Doing a little mentoring? That's great. No, that's not great. It is the opposite of great. It is ungreat. <laughs> We've been trying to find something local to inspire some ideas for Halloween poems. Nothing wrong with that. So, I decided we'd go to Lakeview Cemetery and see Bruce Lee's grave. Well, doesn't the cemetery close at dusk? Yeah, but... Oh, Miss Finney Frock, did you try to show the kids you were cool? You snuck them in? Sneaked, but yeah. And? We couldn't find the grave. We looked and looked. We can't write about a grave we can't even find. I tried to save the night. I thought we could catch the ferry to the peninsula. Oh, Karen, were you really going to play the Twilight card? <laughs> well, does it matter? <laughs> we missed the boat. See, that's a great jumping off point to write about. Oh, well, great. never mind that now. You aren't safe here. Come with us. We have to find this man's fiance. Come on, in here. Oh, doesn't this lead to the Seattle Underground? Yep. Hmm, <laughs> somebody drugged the security guard. We'll have to plunge ahead without him. down here. Enjoy it while you can. Once Big Bertha starts up, all this will come tumbling down. Oh, I think we're under Pike Place Market and all of its ghosts. Ghosts? The saddest one is probably Princess Angeline, Chief Cell's daughter. She lived in a little shack at the bottom of Pike Street. 
Her father was a great leader, and she took in laundry to survive. They say she threw rocks at kids who teased her. Katie, you know a lot about Seattle's history. Sure, this is my adopted home. I boned up on its stories. See, kids, some people like stories. Oh, Karen, don't try too hard. Right. <laughs> okay. Stay calm, friends. We got some zombies. <laughs> Um, about the word zombie, I think it's more than a little insulting for people who actually practice Santeria. Karen, we will talk about this later if we survive. <laughs> Stay calm! It's my fiancé, Robin. She's a zombie! Look, mister, there's only one way to save your fiancé. Put this in her mouth. But, but this is a pretzel. <laughs> for the love of God, do it! Okay, here you go. Come on. Mm. Mm. Oh, where am I? Cole? Robin, honey, you okay? What happened? Well, you were a zombie until... Well, Katie, you're going to have to explain. It's a lesson we learned a long time ago in Alaska. The only thing that keeps any of us from turning into zombies is gluten. Bread keeps us human. Oh, I went gluten-free and low-carb about a month ago. Yeah. It's not uncommon here. That's why Seattle's underground is swarming with zombies. They have us surrounded. Oh, Katie, I can't find Marco. He's missing. We'll find him later. Everybody, listen up. I've got donuts, rolls, toast, and, and wheat thins. Feed the zombies. It's working. Uh-oh. There's too many of them. Oh, come on. Seattleites aren't a bunch of quitters. There's one more trick up my sleeve. The best way to get the most amount of gluten into them fastest is what? Beer? Yes! So if we can lure the zombies under a brew pub... Like the Elysian! Yes! How do you lure zombies? Well, there's a whole bunch of ways. But the easiest is probably to trick them into a dance number. I was walking down Pine in the middle of the night when my eyes beheld a dreadful sight. A crowd was dressed in rotting rugs. Though a few were sporting Cabo messenger bags. Their eyes were unfocused. Their faces were gray. These ghouls slipped about for human prey. Had the city fallen to some terrible box? Then the leader stepped forward with a big boom box. It was a flash. It was a zombie flash. It was a flash. It was a sidewalk bash. It was a flash. A social media smash. A zombie flash. It was a zombie flash. One poor zombie, lips falling away, ducked into Starbucks for a soy latte. Many were dressed in costumes of lint in an effort to reduce their carbon footprint. Programmer students, a vegan masseuse, were all trying to get a bite of caboose. That monster there is that sunny Kobe Cook. Guess the mattress queen is on the Facebook. It was a flash. It was a zombie flash. It was a flash. It was a sidewalk flash. It was a flash. A social media smash. A zombie flash. It was a zombie. You're listening to Howl, the 2013 Halloween show from Sandbox Radio. Check out more from poet Karen Finneyfrock online at karenfinneyfrock.com. That's Karen, F-I-N-N-E-Y, frock.com. The podcast of Sandbox Radio is now available through Stitcher, Radio On Demand. Stitcher is an award-winning free mobile app that helps you listen to all your favorite shows, plus discover the best news, entertainment, and sports on demand. Download the free app from Stitcher.com or the App Store. And now, back to Howl and Markheim. I'm a Markheim, a sort of angel, but not the sort with wings and a harp and a halo. Markheims are the black ops. We do things other angels can't or won't. Me, I'm a talker, subarchy, reverse curse. 
Upstairs pulled me out of retirement for a mission down in this soggy town. But when it was done, I didn't go back. I had questions, and the answers weren't up above in the fix. Now I'm walking neutral, half-fallen in what we angels call the show. But I gotta watch my back, because things can always get uglier. Previously on Markheim. At least take your ticket back. There's no place to hide it up there, you know that. Throw it in the sea. Angels never check there. Demons neither. It's off territory. Dead neutral. All right. There. It sank. Good. You're gonna get bored up here, you know that? That's good. Bored is safe. Well, you say that now. It's no use. You can do it all day. These bullets just melted me like butter. Yum. Now give me. You like guns so much, why don't you eat it? Sam will take this as an act of war. Sam can't win an all-out war. No, but he doesn't always act out of his best interest, does he? Sar Samael has had plenty of warnings. Blaze them all. And now, episode 10 of Markheim by Paul Mullen. My self-imposed exile from downtown is starting to take its toll. Here I am, sitting at the top of a laddered lifeguard's chair, throwing pennies into Green Lake from a roll I got at the key bank across the street. I want to be over. I want to be done. I want to be finished. I want to be gone. I want to... Hey! Hey. What are you doing? You can see me? Of course I can see you. Why are you throwing those pennies into the lake? I'm making wishes. It's not how it works. It has to be a fountain or a wishing well or something. Oh. And are those special pennies? Special? Yeah, like did you find him heads up on the sidewalk or get him his change from buying Pokemon cards? No. And how are they special? I didn't know they had to be. You can't just buy wishes polluting a lake. I'm new to this. The pennies have to be special. Okay. Otherwise, who knows what you might get. Okay. I gotta go. My dad's making that worried face he does when I'm too far off. I don't like it when the meat kids can see me. They seem to know things I don't. I sit in my lifeguard chair as the dark gathers... Something's changed. A bike goes past behind me. I watch it speed on its way, counterclockwise around the lake. Why am I noticing that? Something changed? What, the air? The same neon flame-colored bike passes behind me again. That didn't take long. How far around is this lake anyhow? I can see the bike rocketing its way past the bathhouse. But it isn't just flame-colored now. It is flame. And here it comes again. Markheim. And now the bike is flying faster than any bike or car or human thing could fly, setting the path around the lake on neon fire. You did this. There's something wrong with this bike. On your left, shit. Don't you get high from me, Markheim! For an insane second, I think about diving into the lake to escape Sam's rage. But the notion isn't worth a snort. Water might as well be a wall to an angel. The surface, whether puddle, pond, or ocean, is the edge of utter ignorance. Utter black. Utter lack. Bottomless. What you would call terror we angels call impossible. Impassable. Ain't gonna happen. <sighs> Sam? I'm still working, still collecting information. Are you now? You look pretty relaxed up there in that lifeguard's chair. How do you like my bike? Markheim. I'm not sure I do, Sam. Wanka. Really? But you helped trick it out, see? It's two wheels are the dominations I smoked. And then I made the frame from your victim. I had no choice. You always got a choice, Markheim. For instance, 
You chose to go to Iafield against my express wishes. I needed information. I was hitting brick walls. You chose to pass along my plans to smoke anything from the fixed moving show site in this town. You told me to pass it along. And now she's blazed every single operative I had in this city. Not to the crisp, but gone. For good. How am I going to replace those demons that I lost forever, Markheim? I don't know, Sam. Oh, I do. I got a perfectly good, unsmoked talker, Markheim, staring me flat in the face. I'm neutral, Sam. You guaranteed my neutrality. You want to lawyer up with me? What was my title before I gave notice? Archangel. Of what, Markheim? Archangel of Justice, Sir Damn Samuel. right. I invented lawyers. All guarantees are contingent. And yours was based on you paying information and not fucking me sideways. Sam. Close your eyes and make a wish, Markheim. I'm about to blow you out. I close my eyes and try not to beg, but I fail. Please, Sam, please. I'm no good to you in hell. That's what you think. Sam, stop. I open my eyes. Suddenly she's there, so beautiful, so stark. I feel. Well, I'll be damned if it ain't Keats Angel. Let us smoke her, Sam. Your fallen doms overrate themselves, Sam. Shall I box them for you? Really? Right here? Really, Princess Isle? You take my bike away from me. Enough. We need to talk. Let the Markheim be. He didn't blaze your demons, I did. Fine, let's talk. Where? You choose. Fine. And with that, they were gone. The doms comprising Sam's demented bicycle, Sam himself, and the Angel of Truth. I didn't wonder where they had gone. I was just glad they went. Shh, Black Francis! <laughs> Did, are you sure this is cool? Sure, I'm sure. How are we gonna get Black Francis in through this window? Oh, uh, you go in first, then you can pull him up by the collar, yeah? Okay. It's okay, boy. Come on up. Come on, Black Francis. Come on. Push him up, Ditch. You mean like his butt? Yeah, dipshit. Push his butt. Okay, okay. <laughs> Shit. That's a good boy. Good boy. Well, you coming in or not? Fuck yeah, I gotta sleep too, Liv. Do ya? I thought you were invincible. Doesn't mean I don't gotta sleep. Don't joke about what you don't know about. Welcome to Sky City at the Space Needle. Reservation for two under Joe. Really? Ah, right this way. The Space Needle. What's the problem? It seems a little, I don't know, trite. The truth is often trite, Sam. You know that. This place is sweet and huge. <laughs> Fucking A. My uncle's the contractor on the remodel. No one ever comes here by at night. Where's everybody else? Everybody else who? You know, Stank and Shitsock and Gummy and the crew. This has got room for 20 at least. Fuck them. I can't trust all those people. I need to sleep. It's been hard to sleep lately. Okay, whatever. You pick a room and then I'll pick one. You can pick first. For reals? For reals, but it's gonna get cold. That's cool. I got BF. He likes to snuggle. <laughs> what about me? Find a fucking blanket and sleep in another room. I'm serious, Didge. No bullshit or I'm outies. I wasn't hitting on you. Oh, okay. I'm sick of being lonely. People treat me like a freak. Maybe you shouldn't dress like a freak with that mask of hair and all. <sighs> it's my job. Okay, whatever. You still gotta find another room. Okay, so... So? Come here, boy. Good night. Good night. Truth and justice, together again. <laughs> Hardly. It's dinner, not dating. So? So? You know, I've been looking to retire for a while now. Who's stopping you? Do us all a favor. Not alone. So take someone with you. Not someone. You. <laughs> Let's get serious, Sam, shall we? Is there a point to this parley? I need to find out who's making a move in Seattle. I assume it ain't you, not Withstanding, you wiped out my entire crew here. I don't like it when my operatives are threatened. Clearly. So how do you feel that someone's working a fixed clockwork down here without your knowledge? I'm listening. 
You got a newly minted wandering Jew with glowing hand, taking actions, dropping my name, though it ain't clear he actually knows what that can bring. And you got what smells like a meat walker running him. Now with a wink, I could smoke all these troubles away, but that would still leave me curious. Who's behind it? We started tracking those two about a week ago. <laughs> two? So you don't know about the soother mark I'm in the mix. I'm not gonna get into what we do and do not know. Yeah, okay. I'll tip you the soother for free, I owe. Uh, while I'm down here, I'd appreciate, as a courtesy, that you call me Joe. <laughs> when hell freezes over. I'll hold you to that. If we joined our operation... Oh, Sam... Hear me out. Temporarily, and very, very conditionally, we could smoke this clockwork into some daylight. My orders are hold and defend. Business as usual. And yet, just a few turns ago, we had Dominations torturing a neutral Markheim on the orders of pseudo Sar Regal. I'm looking into that. But I do find your term neutral Markheim curious. What exactly is that? Not sure myself. I'm finding out. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. I'm going to stick with the winning team on this one. I wish I could say I expect a different. And yet, you parley with me. Darling. I'd parley with you every day of the week until hell really did freeze over. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ever the charmer. <laughs> I'm speaking your precious truth and you know it. All the same, winning team, sticking with it. Nothing personal. It never is with you, is it? And it never isn't with you. Guilty. So, I'll see you in hell. If you get that far, team winning's got the guns for it, if not the heart. God knows I'd love to see you again. And I hope you don't. No offense. None taken. The night's dark gradually drains to indifferent gray what passes for daybreak in Seattle's season of fall. I am beginning to find my new squat in Green Lake almost peaceful. My inkling of trouble doesn't dawn until I watch a huge, sopping, long-necked silhouette lurch toward me out of the lake. I'm sitting ten feet up in the lifeguard's chair, but I'm still only staring at its bloated belly. Its head bobs bizarrely at the end of its extended neck. A bloated white hand holds up a dripping piece of parchment to my face. <laughs> I can't read the writing anymore, but I recognize it. My soul silently bottoms out into an abyss of terror. Yes. It's a ticket. Mine, actually. Mine, actually. No, mine. mine. No, mine. It looks different. The writing's changed. Where did you get it? Mine. Fine, yours. Yours. Where did you find it? Found it. Where? That. There. Green Lake, you found it in the water. Oh, water. No more horror. This. Well, that's a ticket to the fix. They only let angels up there. Up there. Good luck, friend. Not friend. Brother. Brother. More. More what? Come. Wait. What does that mean? But the long-necked freak doesn't answer. Instead, it shambles dinosauric through the trees to the east and then on through the house-lined streets. If it was headed to heaven, it had a long way to go and no hopes of getting there, ticket or no. I don't know about uglier, but things just got a hell of a lot weirder. Next time on Markheim. Get back in your own room. I can't sleep, Liv. Unless you want to hug this, I suggest you fuck off. Are you threatening me with a knife? No, I'm warning you with a knife. You. You're the soother 
That's right. It's okay. So, the Seattle Markheims meet. It's all gonna be okay, brother. Yes, yes, by all means, keep trying to glow me. I... I said keep trying. Join us next time for Markheim. There's this trick Sam taught me. Huh? Wanna learn it? that retractor. McLean? McLean? Got it. Blood pressure's dropping. I can't see. Where's... 90 over 69. I can't see his left ventricle. We need more sponges. Can you push him, Marquez? I've already upped the ephedrine. Sponges, Ted. Oh, sponges, here you go. I I could switch to... Oh, Jesus Christ. Don't just dump them all in his chest cavity. Sorry, oh my God, sorry. You train this one, McCain. Teaching cuts. You know that, Robert. Don't be a douche. I'm really sorry. I really Precious am. Precious 85 over 62. Clamp. Clamp. Okay. There we go. Wait. Oh, shit. Suction. Move, move, move. I need more suction. Whoa. Where the heck am I? Oh. What's going on down there? Wow. Look serious. Is that? Hey, I think that's me. Jesus, his blood pressure's still dropping. Look at them all. Working on me like I'm some hopped up Corvette. What the hell happened? Last thing I remember, I was in the Northwest, was eating oysters at that GD fundraiser. You want me to aspirate? I can aspirate. No. Yeah, you stay focused, Doc. You don't want to lose me. I'm what's called a big cheese from the great state of Texas. And I just talked for 21 hours straight, smack dab on the Senate floor. Um, um, should I be doing a sponge count or what? No. no. Talk about your Texas tongue action. Who knows? Keep this one on the DL, but I had to wear a diaper. I need a scalpel now, now, now. Okay. Well, that doesn't sound good. Better turn this around, Doc. Because I could sick Carl Rove on you faster than you can say, I think I can, I think I can. Somebody kick bucket those peanuts. Are you all listening to me down there? Oh, jeez. Why'd I even set foot in this rainy-ass city? It's a GD Republican ghost town. Just a den of commies, drug addicts, and food stamp groupies. Where is all this blood coming from? What blood? Wow, it's a fountain. And it's so red. Is it always that red? Oh, boy. Uh, oh, I don't feel so good. 80 over 35. We're losing him. Oh, holy patooties. McLean. Yes, doctor. Where the heck's the heart-lung machine? Not here. I can see that. Budget cuts. We share it with operating room F now. Share it? Crap! Oh, crap, crap, crap! <laughs> I knew those oysters were a bad idea. That Steve Ballmer guy kept saying they were Medina's finest, Medina's finest. What a load of... What'd I eat those things? They look like horse nuts. Ted, Ted, Ted. You idiot. You know not to touch anything that comes at the table wet. Damn it, McLean, you leave me no choice. Looks like we'll have to just palpitate him by hand. What? 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 This is gonna get good and messy. And gooey, Jim. Don't forget gooey. Oh, 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 oh! Uh, can I do it? Wait, what's she gonna do? What? Are you insane? You're just a lowly surgical tech. Please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please! Give her a chance, Robert. No, 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 no. With all the funding cuts, how's she gonna learn except on the job? Oh, all right, but be careful. Score! What? No worries, I've got this. I've played GTA about a billion times. <laughs> Now, just a GD minute here. 75 over 25. Hey, I'm an elected official. You you can't let some... I'm switching to epinephrine. Careful, careful. Hearts are generally quite squishy, easy to lose your grip. Dios mio. 
just... Did I turn off the sprinklers? I just have to get my hand under his sternum. Before I left Houston. Uh, before I got on uh, the... Oh, God. There! I got it. Uh, wait! Whoa. It's so tiny. <laughs> and, Doctor, it's not squishy at all. It's hard. Hard as a rock. And listen... I'm sensing some, some strange, strange feelings. Like my pants are down. I, I, I'm Keep not... palpitating, Tech. What do you make of this, Marquez? Don't know, Jim. Never seen an organ quite that shriveled up before. <laughs> like a walnut. Amazed it keeps ticking. Could be... Are my pants down? You don't think it's... What? Could just be a case of CCS. What? CCS? Conservative coagulation syndrome. <laughs> Worst case I've ever seen. Oh, God. CCS. Paul Ryan said that was a myth. Watch it, Tech. It's squirting out through the cracks. Turn down the monitor, Tech. Keep palpitating the chambers. Where are my pants? In, out, in, out, in, What the out. hell is that? Sounds like the door, Jim. Oh, man. We're in the middle of a procedure here. Don't answer it. Oh, for God's sake. McLean. Stranger danger. Yes? What is it? Trick or treat. Good God, not now. Just kidding. Who are you? We are the American people. Holy shit. What the hell do you want? We don't know. But we know what we don't want. What's that? We don't want no death panels. So until you can get a handle on this here debt ceiling problem... We're canceling all communist health care. God bless America. Hey, not now, guys. <laughs> that politician you're operating on, his health care is wholly subsidized by the American people. Yeah, and we want that kind of generosity to stop now. But the man's having a heart attack. Oh, should I keep palpitating, Doctor, or...? Um, just like Senator Cruz said... Yes, yes! Jesus died on the cross to save his own behind. Yeah! yeah. We've all got a responsibility to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and die on our own crosses. Yeah! yeah. You know, maybe I should have parsed that a little. So we're sequestering that heart you got there, girly. You can't do that. It's, it's against the law. We're doing it anyway! My God, people, this is a human being on my table, not some alien. Hey, look, let's not overreact here, huh? God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her. Where's that air coming from? I feel air. Oh, Doctor, they're trying to take the heart. Somewhere underneath. Straight. Hang on to it, Tech. From the mountains to the prairie. Oh, oh, it's slipping. Good God. Oh, they picked it up. They're shoving it into a briefcase. Why would those... Better stop the epinephrine, Marquez. This is all just so wrong. Come on, med staff. We can sing too. God damn it, McLean. This isn't the time for politics. Everybody sing. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. <laughs> His truth is marching on. Feeling air on my roots, people. 35 over 16. Hey, y'all. 23 over 7. Am I dying up here? Glory, glory, hallelujah. Holy crap. His truth is marching on. That's it? That's it? Um, wait. What a hang up on my wife. I love my wife. She just called to say she was sorry. She knows how I feel about people who are sorry. What was that so? Stupid. Stupid. She was just trying to... I hurt her feelings. Why'd I fucking do that? Maybe I can get her on the phone. Like in the next few... Just to... Ouch. Hey. Hey, people. What's the deal with this ceiling, huh? We gotta raise it. I gotta get to my pants. <laughs> Wait. I got a phone in my... Uh, no, I don't. 
Heidi, baby, why can't I? Oh God, who's in charge here? Oh God, I want arrows con leche. Ah. We are the American people from Elizabeth Heffron. on Cousin Katie. Oh, God. Marco, Marco, are you okay? We have to get out of here. Something horrible has happened. Really, really horrible. Drink your cocoa, Marco. It's all okay now. I don't like Halloween anymore. Marco, you're safe now. Why don't you tell us what happened? Well, I got separated from you all. Yes? And I, 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 I... I ran into someone. Oh, no. A very friendly someone. Oh, Marco. So what's the problem? I'm just saying, if it's Halloween and you're in a dark tunnel and you run into someone dressed like Cher, a reasonable explanation is that it's a man. But it wasn't. <gasps> it was a lady dressed like Cher? No. It was Cher. <gasps> Marco. Marco. You and Cher? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Whew! This was a Halloween for the record. My cousin Katie from Catcher Can. My cousin Katie.
of Herbert West, who was my friend in college and in afterlife, I can speak only with extreme terror. This terror is not due altogether to the sinister manner of his recent disappearance, but was engendered by the whole nature of his life work, and first gained its acute form more than 17 years ago, when we were in the third year of our studies at the Miskatonic University in Arkham. The wonder and diabolism of his experiments fascinated me utterly, and it shames me to say that I was his closest companion. Now that he has vanished and his fiendish spell broken, my actual fear is greater. Memories and possibilities are ever more hideous than mundane and pitiful realities. The first horrible incident of our cursed acquaintance was the greatest shock I ever experienced and it was only with reluctance that I repeat it. As I have said, it happened when we were in the medical school where West had already made himself notorious. Look, Herbert, you're called to appear before Halsey and the department heads. They cite your wild theories on the nature of death and the possibility of overcoming it artificially. Hmm, another expulsion hearing. It was not the first time he had come into conflict with the college authorities. His views were widely ridiculed by the faculty and his fellow students, and he was finally debarred from future experiments by no less than the dean of the medical school himself. I had always been exceptionally tolerant of West's pursuits, and we frequently discussed his theories whose ramifications and corollaries were almost infinite. He was then a small, slender, spectacled youth with delicate features, yellow hair, pale blue eyes, and a soft voice. <laughs> Holding that all life is a chemical and physical process, and that the so-called soul is a myth, I believe that artificial reanimation of the dead depends only on the condition of the tissues. Unless actual decomposition has set in, a corpse fully equipped with organs may, with suitable measures, be set going again in the peculiar fashion known as Life. So you believe that the nature of life is essentially mechanistic? Precisely. I am convinced I will discover the means for reanimating the organic machinery of mankind by calculated chemical action after the failure of natural processes. My friend, Herbert, are you in earnest? I have already experimented with various animating solutions, killing and treating rabbits, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, and monkeys. I actually obtained signs of life in animals supposedly dead. In many cases, violent signs, but he neglected to tell me. And I can already see that the perfection of this process if indeed possible, will necessarily involve a lifetime of research. It likewise became clear that since the same reanimating solution never worked alike on different organic species, he would require more varied animal subjects for further and more specialized progress. I realize, of course, even a short period of death may be apt to cause impairment to psychic or intellectual life. The slight deterioration of sensitive brain cells? Exactly! I had hoped to find a reagent which would restore vitality before the actual advent of death, but observe. Even when this guinea pig has been freshly killed, and my solution is um, just one more moment. My solution is injected into the blood immediately after the extinction of life. There, you see? No response. The natural and artificial life motions are incompatible. It was this circumstance which made the professors so carelessly skeptical, for they felt that true death had not occurred in any case. They did not stop to view the matter closely and reasoningly. It was not long after that West confided to me his resolution to get fresh 
human bodies in some manner and continue in secret the experiments he could no longer perform openly. But where to procure the anatomical specimens? The potter's field! Why not the cemetery at Christ Church? The obvious quality of Everyone the... buried in Christ Church is embalmed. That would be ruinous to the research. Oh, of course. The potter's field, then. I was by this time his active and enthralled assistant and helped him make all his decisions, not only concerning the source of bodies, but concerning a suitable place for our loathsome work. It was I who thought of the deserted Chapman farmhouse beyond Meadow Hill. It's far from any road and in sight of no other house. Here we are. The ground floor can be fitted as an operating room and a laboratory. And these dark curtains will conceal our light in the event someone is roaming out late. What we can't borrow from the college, I'll purchase anonymously in Boston. We should be able to gather our equipment undetected save to expert eyes. If we are discovered, this whole enterprise is merely a chemical laboratory. Agreed? Agreed. Disposing of bodies is always a nuisance. Even the small guinea pig bodies from early experiments in the boarding house. At college, we used an incinerator, but the apparatus was too costly for our unauthorized laboratory. So we obtained spades and picks for the many burials we should have to make in the cellar. A copy of the Times, please. We followed the local death notices like ghouls for our specimens demanded particular qualities. What we want is a corpse interred soon after death and without artificial preservation, preferably free from malforming disease, and certainly with all organs present. Accident victim would be our best hope. Ah, not for many weeks did we hear of anything suitable. The college had first choice in every case on corpses for teaching purposes. In the end, though, luck favored us for one day. Ah. Here we are, an almost ideal case in the potter's field. An otherwise healthy young cleaning woman from the university drowned only yesterday in Summer's Pond and buried at the town's expense without delay or embalming. That afternoon we found the new grave and determined to begin work soon after midnight. It was a repulsive task that we undertook in the black small hours. Even though at that time we lacked the special horror of graveyards that later experiences brought to us. Right here. Ah! For God's sake! It's all right. It's just a cat. Keep digging. The uh, process of unearthing was slow and sordid. It might have been gruesomely poetical if we had been artists instead of scientists. <laughs> At least we can be thankful there's no rain. <laughs> ah, damn! Hold the lantern here, will uh, you? That's it. Uh, all right. We scrambled down and removed the lid, dragging out and propping up the contents. I reached down and hoard the corpse out of its grave. The affair made us rather nervous, especially the stiff form and the vacant face of our first trophy. Let's get her in the canvas bag. We then managed to remove all traces of our visit. When we had patted down the last shovel full of earth, we set out with the specimen for the old Chapman place beyond Meadow Hill. On the improvised dissecting table in the old farmhouse, by the light of a powerful acetylene lamp, she, or rather it, was not very spectral looking. Now, with its eyes closed, the specimen looked more asleep than dead. We had at last what West had always longed for. A real dead body of the ideal kind, ready for my solution, prepared according to the most careful calculations and theories especially for human use. The tension became 
very great on our part. We knew that there was scarcely a chance of anything like complete success and could not avoid hideous fears at possible grotesque results of partial reanimation. I myself still held some curious notions about the traditional soul of man and felt an awe at the secrets that might be told by one returning from the dead. A larger specimen will require a greater quantity of fluid. Move the light so I can see the vein in its arm. Here we go. Now, bind the incision. Hurry, securely. Good. Now we must be patient. The waiting was gruesome. Every now and then, West applied his stethoscope to the specimen and bore the negative results philosophically. After about three quarters of an hour, well, shh, just a moment. No, nothing. The solution is obviously inadequate. We'll have to make the adjustments to the formula immediately if we want to make another attempt tonight. I understood. I've, I've got the lamp. We had that afternoon dug a grave in the cellar which would be filled by dawn for the body would not even be approximately fresh the next night. So we left our silent guest on the slab in the dark and bent every energy to the mixing of a new solution in the adjacent laboratory supervised by West with an almost fanatical care. The awful event was sudden and wholly unexpected. I was pouring something from one test tube to another, and West was busy over the alcohol lamp, when from the pitch black room we had left, there burst the most appalling and demonic series of cries that either of us had ever heard. Not more unutterable could have been the chaos of hellish sound if the pit itself had opened to release the agony of the damned, for in one inconceivable cacophony was centered all the supernal terror and unnatural despair of animate nature. <laughs> window like stricken animals overturning the burning lamp, bolting madly into the starred abyss of the rural night. We stumbled frantically towards the town, though as we reached the outskirts we put on a semblance of restraint just enough to seem like belated revelers staggering home from a debauch. We managed to get to West's room where we whispered with the lamp on until dawn. By then we calmed ourselves a little with rational theories so that we could sleep. But that evening, Two items in the paper, wholly unrelated, made it impossible for us to sleep. The old deserted Chapman farmhouse had inexplicably burned to an amorphous heap of ashes. That we could understand because of the upset lamp, but this we could not understand. An attempt had been made to disturb a new grave in the potter's field, as if by futile and spadeless clawing of the earth. The body had not been quite fresh enough. A body must be very fresh indeed. It would have been better if we could have known it was underground. For West would never afterward be able to shake off the maddening sensation of being hunted. And for the next 17 years, Herbert West would look frequently over his shoulder and complain of fancied footsteps behind him.
it. Megan Ayers, Eric Ray Anderson, Heather Hawkins, Laura Kenny, Charles Leggett, David Natale, Peter Dylan O'Connor, Rebecca Olson, Annette Chitangi, Catherine Van Meter, Sean John Walsh, Richard Zyman. <laughs> With our very special guest, poet Karen Finneybrock! <laughs> Dan Tierney on drums. Dave Glasgow on the bass. Rob Whitmer accordion clarinet. Charles Leggett on the harmonica. And on the keys, Jose Chusi Gonzalez. And I'm your host, Leslie Long. Because now's the time in the show when we'd love for you to sing along. I think you know the tune. Ready? Here we go. Sandbox Radio Howl was written by Scott Augustson, Elizabeth Heffron, Paul Mullen, and Wayne Raleigh, with original music composed by Jose Juicy Gonzalez. Howl was recorded by Christopher Stewart and mixed by Dave Pascal. Our sound tech was Max Langley, and our stage manager was Colleen Nielsen. Follow us on Twitter and catch up on any episodes you've missed at our website, sandboxradio.org. Sandbox Radio is made possible by the generous financial support of our audience members and listeners like you. Help us create future episodes with a tax-deductible donation at sandboxradio.org. Hope to see you at the next live show, and thanks for listening.